Good day everyone, welcome to another episode in our What If series, where we bring you insights in the format of a What If question on the ever-evolving landscape of employment law. I am Ross Simon from Master Mule, and in today's episode, we shall unpack what if a protected strike becomes plagued by serious violence and intimidation? Does the strike lose its protected status? What are the applicable legal considerations and implications? This issue was decided by the Labour Court in the matter of African Meat Industry and Allied Trade Union and others versus Shave and Gibson Packaging. As we always do, let us start by setting out the background and the facts of the matter. On the 18th of June 2018, members of the union embarked on a protected strike in support of its demands which included wage increases, guaranteed bonuses and the removal of the HR manager. The employer met the union's demands with a lockout. During the strike and lockout, serious acts of violence and damage to property took place. The employer approached the court for an interdict prohibiting the unlawful actions. The order was granted. However, the unlawful actions of the strikers continued. The unlawful actions of the strike employees included conduct such as preventing people from entering the employer's premises, brandishing weapons, threatening and attacking non-striking workers, the stoning of motor vehicles belonging to the employer and client of the employer, and on the 24th of July, the employer reported to the union that one of its vehicles, vehicles rather, was shot at whilst being driven by one of its employees during the early hours of that morning. Many weeks after the strike commenced, the union informed the employer that the striking employees wished to resume their duties with the employer. The employer refused their request and instead instituted disciplinary proceedings against the striking employees. The employer leveled the following charges against the striking employees. Participation in an unprotected strike, derivative misconduct for failing to identify persons who were involved in the violence and thus failing to act in the best interest of the employer, contempt of the court order, and harassing and or intimidating or assaulting individuals employed or contracted by the employer. All but four of the employees were dismissed for misconduct. The employees subsequently challenged the fairness of their dismissal in the Labour Court. Among several issues that the court had to determine in considering the fairness of their dismissal, the issue that is material to address the question posed in this What If episode is the issue of whether the strike lost its protected status. At the strike's inception, it was regarded as a protected strike because it complied with the relevant statutory provisions of the Labour Relations Act. In the ordinary course, Dismissing the employees for participating in the strike would be deemed automatically unfair. However, the employer argued that given the fact that the strike had become protracted, the strikers had made unreasonable demands, and the strike was marred with severe violence and intimidation, the strike lost its protected status. The applicant's case, among several other challenges to the employer's case, argued that the strike remained protected and it was not at the competence of the employer to clothe itself with powers of a court and declare that the strike was not protected. The employer's first argument that the strike had lost its protected status because it had become protracted was rejected by the court on the basis that there was no legal authority which holds that an otherwise protected strike loses its protection after a protracted duration. The court rejected the employer's second argument that the strike was unprotected because wage demands were unreasonable. The court once again found that this argument did not have any basis in law. The court confirmed the principle that if the demand relates to matters of mutual interest between employer and employee, does not fall foul of Section 641A or Section 65 of the Labor Relations Act, and does not require the employer to act unlawfully. The demand is lawful. Lastly, in determining the employer's argument that the strike lost its protected status because it had been marred by violence and intimidation, the court referred to previous decisions of the Labour Court, journal articles by respected academics, practitioners and other obiter dictum from this court, that courts may in certain cases be willing to declare a strike unprotected 
if strike violence constitutes an implied limitation on the right to strike. The court summarized that once violence replace, replaces rather the refusal to work as the focal point of the strike, then it no longer qualifies as a strike as defined and the protection granted by the Labor Relations Act no longer applies. This transition takes place at the point where violence takes its toll, resulting in non-strikers and replacement laborers refusing to work. It is at this point that the striking employees secure an illegitimate advantage that serves to skew collective bargaining and places the employer under illegitimate economic duress. Despite the court having considered these views as compelling, it however refused to accept them, deciding that rendering the strike unprotected would impermissibly denude the constitutional right to strike of those striking employees who exercise their right peacefully. Therefore, colleagues, it is important to be cognizant of the fact that courts may, in very exceptional circumstances, take an approach different to the one adopted in this matter and be willing to declare a strike unprotected if it was accompanied by serious acts of violence and intimidation. Furthermore, it reaffirms the importance of protecting the constitutionally enshrined right to strike, notwithstanding violence and intimidation. By cementing the legal position that a strike marred by violence is not automatically rendered unprotected. That brings us to an end of this week's episode. Thank you for joining us. We hope you have found our discussion informative. If you have any questions or comments, we'd love to hear from you. You can find us on social media or you can email me at ross at massconsulting.co.za. Until next time, bye-bye.